I sent Trevor a picture of me with my shirt off this morning just because I wanted him to see how lean I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I have a silly He's question. Like, Good job, Dane. <laughs> you did well, Dane. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Let me scratch. Why don't your you back. send this to your wife? <laughs> <laughs> she because she saw me take the picture and she's oh. like, "What are you doing? <laughs> sending it to Trevor? Why? Why are you sending Trevor a picture with your shirt off?" <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Garage Strength Podcast, where we're going to help you become a master of sport. Earl, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm I'm wearing the same shirt as last episode. Yeah, that's all right. Me too. Survival, horror, like Silent Hill. You ever play Silent Hill? No. Resident Evil? I played Resident Evil probably back in like 2001. Yeah. Well, this one's like, this game is like 2016 maybe came out. Okay. And it's like, that type of thing some lovecraftian vibes to it yeah i beat it in like under nine hours and it, <laughs> i got like one apparently there's more than one ending i got the one i like i'm like all right survival horror isn't my style of game like i'm more like give me my zelda likes and i'll play through those multiple times from software bloodborne all what do you think is the most important lesson that you've learned from playing video games um just persistence oh interesting on a bat unwilling to fail yeah um problem solving and there's i forget who wrote the book but i read this one book and they talk about telescoping so think of a game and like you have to beat the final boss but to beat the final boss you have to do this to be able to do this you have to do that to do that you have to be able to do this so it just sort of teaches you like sequencing yeah of what needs to be done to achieve something and I'm not like so into video games where I'm speed running. I'm trying to like break that chain and like figure out the matrix, if you will. But it teaches you like, hey, you have to do this before you can do that. Real cut and dry. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they're just fun. What I like about video games more so than reading, and I'm someone who loves to read, and I even like watching like cinema movies, is I'm given agency within the world. Okay. So yeah, like yeah. Um, if I'm watching TV, a lot of times you – can turn off and be passive. Like even if I'm watching YouTube, I can just be passive towards it if I want to. Right. With a video game, I can never be passive, at least the games I play. I always have to be like mentally on. Um, and then there's pattern recognition too. Just like you play some of these games, like you have to hear the tells, see the tells, right, and then react from there. So there's a lot of little things in that nature that are fun. When you're in the video game, who do you see yourself as? Like, what kind of character? Are oh, you, are you um, like the hero, or I am without question. It's pure power fantasy too. Like, um, the games I like play in like a a great space. Like, I love this game Bloodborne, and like. You're killing these other characters, like the not NPCs, because like they'll attack you, but they call you like a beast the whole time, and and by the end, like you realize, like you are the beast, like you're literally killing town folk the whole time, yeah, like you are this sort of thing they despise in a way, um, and it's just neat, like that. So would like, you be the villain in that case? Uh, yeah, but through the lens of you playing the video game as like the player character you really have to like think through it to realize that. But for the most part, you think you're the hero all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Hero of legend, dude. Like, yeah. Wizard of legend or something. I, that was I, I, when you were describing that, that was something that I actually wanted to talk to you about when we are training athletes. And sometimes when we're recording them, I think it's important. F- and I think this goes into like the athlete reactive analysis is looking at the athletes and who they are in the story arc. Okay. Because it's happening in front of you. And if you can slow it down and think through like, well, this kid's the hero, this kid's the villain, like this kid's. Yeah. How do you see yourself in the narrative? Yeah. Yeah. And like, where are you? Are you, you know, how are you? Well, sometimes though, like in the video game, like you'll flat out role play and be like, yo, I'm a villain. Yeah. I'm going to play as the villain. Like, right. I'm going to GTA this and go like, kill old women or something like that like <laughs> it's not like you're really gonna go do this but it's yeah. like here in this virtual environment that's like, what's happening yeah yeah it's, i, I just, i i was interested in that yeah i'm 
typically I don't kill NPCs in, in games. What's an NPC? Non-playable character. They're usually just someone who ends up talking like in a village or something oh, like that. Okay, okay. Um, you know what game, based off your question, you should have every single one of your athletes play the game. It's called Undertale and just see how they play the game. And that's, and that's going to help feed. I, I think it would relate to that. Jason knows what I'm talking about with it. Um, And then there's like, you can do different, like there's people who, who are so good at video games. They do what are called pacifist runs and they won't kill any of the villains. They'll okay. beat the whole game without, um, they'll, that's and, pretty cool actually. And then they'll do genocide runs yeah, where they, they like kill you everybody have to, you have to kill it hundred percent. Anyway, like, I don't know. It's a real neat little community type of stuff and yeah. how they do it. Um, and it's fun. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, what well, probably this audience wants to hear about instead of me like <laughs> leaving out on on video games and how they create like hand eye coordination and like goal setting type of things. Um, imagine. I know everyone likes this. I'm going to read this. You walk into the gym and you begin with a technical coordination complex. You do a one box clean plus two front squats and a clean. You work static at the same weight for four sets. You then go ahead and do some weighted pull-ups for five sets of five, ramping up the weight each set. You then do some arm targeting work, unweighted curl-ups, overhead tricep extensions with a kettlebell, and trap bar drag curls with a cheat. Ooh, nice. Um, big pump, big pump. You end the lifting session with some easy bar spider curls and a dumbbell French press. For cardio to finish off the session, you do kettlebell snatches with a two pood kettlebell and some burpees. All right. Nothing fancy. That's a pretty long workout, though. Depends on if you do it like a thrower or if you do it like a crossfitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next day, your trunk and abs are rocked. Yeah. Why is that, Dane? Uh, I was thinking right as you said the, I think you said tricep extensions. Yeah. Uh, I had done uh, flywheel tricep extensions on Monday or Tuesday of this week, and my abs were sore still on Wednesday. And I was like, it's so funny because people get so mad. Like, we, we had this bro sesh with the football guys that were home, uh, and they're all – Dude, none of them have like good technique l with anything. <laughs> like they're just going, but they're all like, "Dude, my biceps, my traps, or my triceps, my traps," and watch them do drag curls and stuff, and they're like just like cranking, boom, boom, and all these internet warriors. If we ever release a video, are gonna challenge us and say how stupid it yeah, was. But that's why I made a point to say the drag curls were a cheat, right? Because the intensity can just go through the roof well and, and the mus it's so much fun <laughs> and, and when you're when you were explaining it i think you even had a couple bicep stuff in there i was thinking like there's so many times that you're when you're cheating you can use your trunk you know when you're trying to even lift heavier weights like with the the cleans you're using your abs you're using your back and and if we would define what the trunk specifically would be uh you're gonna see that if we look at the entire like abdominal sheath everything you know both layers and then even looking at a bit of your lats a bit of your erectors um, um that's what i would consider your trunk to be even ho hooking in and attaching like um your psoas piriformis your glutes to a point it all plays a little bit of a role but it's mainly your abs and like your erectors is how i think as like the the main muscles of the trunk so the the cleans you know the tricep extensions all of those movements the drag curls all of those movements, even I think the kettlebell sound you had in there, are really supported and, and structured based from your trunk. Yeah. So that's why your abs got so So right. what we're going to talk about today, like what we're going to try to get into is uh, the trunk as the peripheral muscle targeted. Yeah. And how like you can never not sort of work the trunk. Right. And at least if you want to be have dynamic trunk control. Did you say French press in there? I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the because that gets lengthened. That was time. with the the spider curls. Too. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. So you're yep. in like that, I don't know, on the knees or yeah. whatever you're yeah. doing it like, and then so because we all know like at least here garage strength, you know, people use parabolic periodization, garage strength program design, and all stuff like that. That like the front squat, cleans back squat, like that's the best ab work. One hundred percent. Like. Yeah. It is. It's if you want dynamic trunk control, like that's what you need. That's where you start. Like when we that 
previous episode when we were talking about like coaches repeating like do this do this yep same thing with like programming mm-hmm. do this do this do this type of thing or at least the idea i know you use more variation in that but it's still but i'm using variation of the same yeah nine exercises all right so the question is the trunk is the powder keg of the dad bod yep. and athleticism right like it comes from there why are so many why do so many exercises work the tr- the core like why i think this goes back to the discussion around levers and if oh. you think about leverage and in the the balance point essentially or like the point of rotation if 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 the lever arm is going to be longer and let's say it's the chest or it's your arm or it's your even to a point possibly your leg so then that would if it's your leg it's going to shift to that center of stability is going to be your hip but that hip is still going to be linked into where our trunk is right and if we're looking at okay well what if it's my arms or what if it's like my upper back or whatever if that's the lever arm when i'm moving something or if i'm doing an exercise the trunk is essentially s- s- providing that massive amount of stability and i think you know we use co-contractions as a term uh, that is easy, identifiably easy uh, to see in an ankle or in a knee joint or in a shoulder joint. But even when you're looking at the trunk, you know, I just explained it's basically the erectors along with the transverse and rectus abdominis. Okay, so if we think about it that way, it's your abs and it's your back. Always co contracting at all times to, prov- to provide as much stability as possible so that you can exercise or so that you can hit these big time movements at varying speeds through varying degrees and varying angles and do it with minimal amounts of noise. So no hiccups in your actual pattern. Yeah, um, recently there was something you were talking about and it was like you said, uh, I know we talk about noise like in, with reflexive movements and like how to make things more difficult to create more noise. And like that's why you do a variation or so. And you talked about um, – quieting uh the it was with a pool i forget exactly what it was but it was talking about quieting what goes on like for stability right um and as you were talking just now i thought about the trunk as the silencer of the body yeah 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 like yeah i mean even even if we use the reference of like weapons like yeah it literally is doing that it's silencing it's if if you have it trained and you know how to use it that's what it's that's what its purpose is and i even i was i think that this is a big difference between the best athletes in the world and the ones that are sub elite and and athletes when you talk about uh football players that that can just maybe they're not the strongest but when they hit you they rock you like (laughs) wrestlers that like they're not weight room strong but they're but when they're on their mat on the mat you're like god like how is this dude this strong the throwing world, you know, Ryan Krauser was not that strong when he was throwing ungodly far. Now he's gotten really strong and he's able to sort of develop off of that that base that he had. And what the difference is, is those 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 very those athletes that their body is smarter. They know how to apply and use everything that they have. It's because of the way that their their trunk has developed. They they have such stability around their trunk. So when they do, you could watch a, a kid do plyometrics for the first time. He'll do an advanced plyometric movement. There's no stutter stepping. There's there's no like period of time to really figure it out. There's you know maybe one time through and then they then they have it. And I think that that's where that's like the biggest difference between the elite level and the the sub elite is how well they're coordinating that and and, and, and quieting like, the noise so the trunk is like the quieter right yeah. like how do we say it peace and calm and you know the noise isn't coming in to distract the body from you know tipping over getting off balance i wanted to i let me cut Go you ahead. off i wanted to when you were describing some of that scenario and when i was thinking through your question the way i look at the trunk and i think that you're going to really enjoy this comparison is like especially because i i'll I'll attribute a lot of the energy stuff that i learning with the energy systems and how they function was from you just sort of pestering me to try and understand it a little bit more but i look at the trunk 
the way I look at the aerobic system. You know, when we talk about energy systems in strength and conditioning, we think about, oh, now the, the aerobic system is being used. Oh, now yeah. the a lactic system. Oh, now the glycolytic system is being used. But that's not how it is. The aerobic system is always doing its job. And then when there's specific needs for boosters at certain points, we tap into the other ones, right? We yeah, tap it, into the other. It's kind of like systems. how you tap into like your type two muscle fibers. Yeah, or, yeah. Like and it's just like okay, we're running up a hill. Let's get the a lactic a lactic system. Yeah. But the aerobic system at all times during your entire life, no matter what, it's working. It's always do happening. It's never not doing that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be alive. The way I look at the trunk and dynamic trunk control is the exact same way I look at the aerobic system. If this trunk is stable, okay, it's always existing. It's all me just hitting sitting here right now. I'm using my trunk muscles to uphold posture, to breathe, to do the things that I have to do on a regular basis. And then we have to train those other two or three types of trunk methods to elicit and pull from when we when we need to tap into those high threshold, you know, not even the high, high threshold, threshold uh, trunk trunk unit, unit yeah whatever we want to <laughs> we want to term it and i think that that's like the big that's i i truly 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 believe strength coaches need to change the way they look at one energy systems based off this comparison but two the way you're looking at the trunk it's the aerobic system and the better my aerobic system is in 80 percent of sports the better my performance is going to be the better and more stout your your trunk is as far as athletics is concerned the better you're going to perform but you've got to see that through the lens of a front squat through the lens of a, a single leg squat and and being in that position through the lens of reflexive movements yeah. through the lens of high speed plyometrics not necessarily doing how strong your abs are in an isolation movement yeah. but how strong your abs through like a compound movement right. through like change of direction movements and when you were making um like the the trunk is the aerobic like the aerobic thing is like always stay upright right mm -hmm. like always hold there and i started thinking through like um deceleration type of things like as a power thing and then like all right so i need to recruit more units when i'm going to cut right yeah yep. and then the acceleration uh, i think is easier for people to like grasp because many people have started to run Right, right, right. It's much harder to stop and go and stay real fast. Yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I. It's funny because even this is getting a little bit away from what you were just saying. But if you look at, if you look at the trunk, because I even think I think like the trunk provides this like. Think about the trebuchet trebuchet example that sits in place and it has an anchor basically. Yeah, the anchor is in place. And then it swings around depending upon what you're doing. Think about a foxtail. Someone's throwing the foxtail. They let go of the foxtail. The individual hand, that becomes the anchor. That's your trunk. That's your core. It's very similar to if we're running at full speed, your trunk is the anchor actually when you're running at full speed. And the hip becomes where it connects in. And then you're cycling around it. And that becomes a trebuchet part of your body. So it's this, it's, it's changing the way that we look at levers and it's changing the way that we look at how the trunk works in conjunction with the hip. And, and then when we can see things through that lens and that's where it's important to, to, to even listen to other coaches and the, uh, and how other coaches see other movements. Cause then you can pull that into your own realm and go, Oh, now I see how this can relate to sprinting or whatever you're doing. Nice. Yeah. It's great that you said that. Cause like, the transition I have here is like the trunk literally connects the whole body, right? Like, right, right. I know it's obvious, it, yeah. but sometimes you need to state the obvious to like realize it. Like the trunk houses all our vital organs too. Yeah. Like yeah. So it's protective. besides the brain, like that's what's there. Like any other organ you have that you need to live is in the trunk, like right. torso. Right. For the most part. Right. And it like keeps you upright and it connects all four limbs. So when you were talking about like your trucheys, like the hip joint, the shoulder joint, like I guess, maybe technically your shoulders aren't connected because it's more the upper torso but like the, it still provides a stability yeah. though factor there and think that'll help snatch so i'm curious then is like think about this actually quick think right. about a snatch you catch a snatch your back your erectors and your abs provide stability for the shoulder joint yeah maybe that's why i could always snatch more than i could clean <laughs> yeah. or the same amount about um so 
why when we work the trunk right and we develop dynamic and hardly ever have to do isolation movements for the trunk why Which, does that happen like what is it about like selecting like you just said a snatch mm -hmm. and how, like you could I, I let's use like someone like junior for example okay like junior probably never did ab exercises until recently and yeah. his trunks like as solid as can be yeah and oh, he squatted clean and jerked and snatched, snatched. yeah all right all the time basically i think that i think it's like i think it's finding like what are the best movements that have the best bang for your buck carry over mm -hmm. and and that that's what you should be using you know across all wavelengths and i or across all training modalities and i think well, the way i even look at um developing like a, an elite level athlete a lot of people will say well my abs feel weak how do your abs feel weak if we're squatting or front squatting or you know single leg squatting so then i then i realize that when people do say that it's really they just they like to feel like that ab burn so i don't it's not that i don't think that that isolation ab exercises I, I do believe they have their place physically but i think they have a greater place for mental uh growth for the athlete to feel i feel my abs are strong because they're sore or whatever the next day and i think that if if we understand that we move in a global pattern that's when we're doing competitive movements when we're doing competitive uh you know competitions whatever when we're competing in a throw or a lifting or whatever sport you're in on field yeah on a court yeah whatever Swinging the pickleball racket. Exactly. You're always moving globally together, but the, the trunk is always providing some sense of stability. Um, and so I think it's important to, to train that way and to train with complex movements. And I think that one area that a lot of people miss is that they do a ton of med balls. They'll do a ton of you know, planks or whatever. And it's like, they'll spend hours upon hours doing medicine ball throws and they they have their place, but you could spend 15 minutes doing higher intensity cleans and get way more out of it. Bang for your buck. And I guarantee you, I could take a kid who's never thrown a med ball. Who's done cleans with me for five years. And they would launch the med ball further than you <laughs> who spent the last three years throwing the med ball internet challenge. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> That's where it just goes back to like the finding the best bang for your buck movements and knowing like the layers that you get out of it. What are the layers as I dig deeper into the cake? What am I going to come upon? It's not just, you know, how explosive they are, how mobile they are or how how quickly their their neural drive and intelligence improves. But it's also going back to that trunk control. And then when we do things like plyometrics, can they transfer that over? And like that's that's why we have the system set up the way it is. I want to just throw credence to anyone trying to get their apps to pop out, and like you're on that like fifteen percent, ten percent like body yeah, yeah. thing. Um, personal experience, and this is anecdotal. My abs look better after I clean than after I do isolation movements. I always I always think that too. It's like even um, yeah e yeah cleaning squatting yeah lunging with a bar on your back. I, I agree. If you wait like eight hours and it's like, oh, let me go. Yeah, know. let me go. Let me go get an ego shot. Yeah. Oh, look, they're there. Where if I do like. I did that this morning. I sent I sent Trevor a picture of me with my shirt off this morning just because I wanted him to see how lean I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I have a silly He's question. Like, Good job, Dane. <laughs> you did well, Dane. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Let me scratch Why don't back. you send this to your wife? <laughs> <laughs> she because she saw me take the picture. and She's oh. like, what are you doing? <laughs> sending it to trevor why why are you sending trevor a picture with your shirt off <laughs> i want to rub it in um this question since we're talking about like trunk as peripheral work like you're not directly targeting but you just can't help it it's going to happen how does that happen with the upper body and what movements would you recommend that it does happen the most with in the upper body and I have a few I would just ask about too. Like, like pull ups with the weight in your feet, pull ups with your knees flexed, uh, rope climb, sled pull with a with a rope, one arm row, um, Z presses, uh, 
still bench press, you're going to flex your trunk to provide a nice stable base. Watch the best benchers in the world. They get set, they squeeze through their, their abs and they set their back and then they can bench more because that's their foundation. Uh, a lot of alternating dumbbell presses. Um, I, I wanted to share this when we were doing plyos. It's funny that you said this because Jake was talking to me. We had Nick doing some a unique progression and essentially we were doing we started the warm-up where we did like a drop in a single leg squat and then you lock out the band here and i was like this is getting him ready to compress and like feel these different positions wake up his trunk then we did this thing where we did like a rotation on one leg and he, and and you're standing on one leg so you feel it in your glute while you're rotating with your trunk it, it almost felt like an upper body exercise for him but it was him like waking his trunk up a little bit more so that when we did the really advanced crazy plyometrics that we were doing his trunk was fully fully primed and able to handle the cuts that we were going to be hitting in training and i think that i don't even remember what your initial question was but upper, I think, body, oh, the movement, upper body yeah where you get peripheral work in right. the trunk and i think that finding those again it goes back to like we can do all the functional stuff in the world, but if I'm doing dumbbell alternating presses with one tens for a set of 12 on each arm and I'm going, boom, boom, yeah. I've got to have a strong ab. I have to have strong abs or a core or a trunk to do that. Yeah. What do you think is better for the abs? Horizontal pressing or overhead pressing? Overhead. Why? I think you just, I, th I think this goes back. Well, okay. Most cases heart are overhead because the lever changes uh, and you're in a different position where you're you've got to use your hips and your trunk a little bit more. Um, the only thing I would argue against myself in that answer is that on a flat bench or something or a dumbbell bench that's flat, you can use more weight. But I I honestly think the the one movement the one consistent movement. That, All right, then what happens if you go overhead using a more dynamic movement than just like a press, like you then do more a jerk? Yeah, like a push press or a jerk for yeah, sure. Yeah, where you can intensity can match it 100 percent right? that you're gonna be you're like gonna just curious push sam, press or jerks sam bench press more or jerk more or about the yeah, same? almost the exact same all right yeah almost the exact same but it's a lot faster in the jerk yeah i i would even say using that example if you did like a a rope climb like a really fast rope climb or a rope climb with dumbbells in your feet um which we've done quite a bit like that's where you're going to get a ton of trunk work because you're trying to stabilize your shoulders. But now thinking back through that lever lens, the plate or the weight is in your feet. Mm -hmm. So you also have to, you're, you're essentially lengthening your body as much as possible. And there's a load. Yeah. Gravity is doing top, its work. And there's a load at the bottom. And so everything passes through the trunk. And that's when you really it's start almost like a notice. hammock. Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. It's exactly like a hammock. I think that's when you when you start to to notice how those things are functioning. Nice. Um, so before we go into lower body movements, I was going to talk about buying a single leg squat stand and foam balance pad. I think that's where it's like if you head over to garagefrank.com and you do a single leg front squat. Okay, a single leg front squat is probably one of the best movements. A, traditional single leg squat you're in an unstable position with a load that especially if you get a little bit of a forward lean it's going to light up your hand or your glutes and it you have to have a stable trunk to do that would if you you did that with a safety squat bar would it do even more damage or are you like nah don't do that it, it could it could do yeah why could it like I mean, just your brain, it's what pulling because of where the the load is, how high it is up on your neck. Yeah, so I, it pushes I, you forward a little bit more. Yeah, a little it forces more. you to both. It pushes you forward, and then you're more aware of staying as upright as okay. you can. Um, so yeah, get the single leg squat. Yeah, go stand. to garagefrank.com and pick up a single leg squat stand. All right, let's talk about the trunk then with lower body movements, and I think I'm really curious about both the posterior and the anterior sequence. Ooh, here. With. So you're saying leg exercises that target both. Yeah. And what happens to like, maybe this is just me off and never, never land type of thing, but why maybe you're more advanced athletes. If you ask them to do like a leg extension or something like simple like that, 
are somehow going to start feeling their core light up versus like a newbie will just be like, I only feel it in my legs. Is that because they're doing it wrong? Because they're or is bracing, that... how okay. they brace. It's like everything that they're in tune with their body, they're bracing all the time. That's why they're the guys that like, like, dude, do this with, with Haley. Just walk past her and like give her a little bump. Like just, I mean, don't actually do that. But like, yeah. Hypothetically, give her a bump. She's 110 pounds and you go to hit her and she doesn't move. It's like, she's, if you watch her sitting, if you know, if you're watching this, she's always sitting like this. She's perfectly upright rigid as hell like just always she's never like uh like i am yeah you know it's like that's that's where me too yeah it's like let me know she's, she's so in tune with just how to have a properly functioning trunk and i think that that's where uh if you're looking at leg exercises all of them really target it but it, you'll you'll see like that you know, using the, the example of what you just provided, it's the same reason why guys that never leg press, if they're athletes, they get on a leg press, they put a thousand pounds on because they're blowing up their abs while they do it. And then they get like a bounce from their quads off their abs because they know how that feels. That's the power of the dad bod. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. If you know how to use it. Uh, and man. I think that that's like the, that's a real big factor that a lot of people just continuously gloss um, over. I do not have the strongest squat. But I do know how to make my abs look up. big yeah. and fat. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I can vacuum, like oh, like in, the, like I could do like what I call like the yoga like looking one. Yeah, yeah. And I I have a buddy I work with. He's like, you look so fat. I'm like, dude, I can do the other way if you want me to too. I'm just right. like I'm content repping the power. I think that's a pretty good skill actually, the vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw it on the internet. I actually remember it. There's like a King of the Hill episode where Hank starts doing yoga to like fix his back. Yeah. And like the guy like teaching yoga is like sort of more like a, a gym bro, like Chad type of my, like stereotype, archetype. Yeah. Instead of like, oh, cool. Like it's more like let me flex on you type of thing. Right. And every time the guy like flexes on Hank, he does like the vacuum. <laughs> so that's my thought to it. Like that's the image I see. I want to be like the guy flexing on Hank. Yeah. Well, no, just that thing. Like it's like, Yeah. I don't want to flex on anyone. Oh, we got to do overrated, underrated. All right, let's go. You ready go. for this? Yeah. Uh, G H D sit ups, overrated or underrated? Dude, that's a good one because I used to think that they were the most overrated, stupid exercise ever, and I thought they were terrible for people to do. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna actually give them a fair shake. I actually I talked to John from Mobility Doc. He's like, yeah, I mean, I don't think they're terrible. I don't know if I would do them all the time. So then I, I felt like I had the blessing that I could try them. Dude, I did them for the first time. This is probably just like nine months ago. I couldn't sneeze for like three days. So I'll say they're 100% overrated. And I think... Wait, overrated or underrated? Underrated, underrated, underrated. underrated. Yeah, I think they're over... I think they're... I think people ignore them. Yeah, they're they're 100% underrated. People ignore the GHD ab because ab or crunch because they're like me. They're like, oh, crossfitters are stupid. I don't like that. So <laughs> I think that exercise is dumb. It looks stupid. But like when I tried it, I got completely destroyed. It tears you up. Yeah. And now I like to just play around with it with band exercises, with plates. And now, now it's like a whole new world has opened up for me to actually so stimulate Now that. my next question to you, Dane. Have you ever done a big enough set where your quads start firing? Yes. On yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> for sure. When I've done like different isometrics where I'm holding my hips and my quads. Yeah, it's like... You want to talk about an anterior sequence yeah, exercise? That's when you feel like... It. Oh. I, you'll have people say that about even even just doing v-ups and that's the one thing too is it's like if you're doing a v-up or a hanging leg raises it's just as much hip as it is your abs and there's there's like these gurus that'll be like well if you know you shouldn't do those why not like you you should yeah. try to feel your hip in with your abs like that's part of being an athlete so since you brought up crossfit and one of the early CrossFit things was like the way they do pull-ups like with the kip and the butterfly and they're like yeah. that's not that and, and I'm thinking I'm like the more you think about it, like a strict pull-up, maybe it's harder to do because of the strength requirement. But from a skill requirement, it's actually the easier Easiest. movement. Yeah. Because you don't have to coordinate as many muscles right. and get into like sort of a rhythm and a flow. It's like... Well, people uh, are just targeting the... They would target the kipping pull-up and say like... They would say it's you're not getting 
the the gains that you would get out of doing a strict pull up, but people aren't doing a kipping pull up because they want to focus on the yeah. gains from a pull up. They're doing a kipping pull up because they're in a competitive environment and they need to get as many reps as possible with whatever technique they're using. So there's two different things going on here. Yeah, and I think that that's where people forget. And you coordinate more muscle, you can do more work. Yeah, like yeah. Anyway, we digress. Uh, overrated, underrated. ASMR. Hollow body rocks. I actually think hollow body rocks are underrated. I think it's like one of those few movements that, dude, I, I'll start to do them. And if I've got a plate over my over my head, I literally start like shaking. And it, and again, it goes, you'll feel the hips if your hips yeah. are a little weak or tight. Like, I think they're underrated. I think a lot of people could benefit from doing a hollow body rock and then actually rolling onto their stomach and holding like a Superman and then going back and then going back to the hollow position. It's like, it's, it's a really, really good movement. Yeah. The, um, the hollow body rock with the plate on the shins, I think is oh, worse brutal. than the plate overhead. Dude, it's, yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> it's, ooh. All comes back to the leverage. Yeah. Uh, I, am tempted to agree with you on the hollow body rock that it is um, a lot of people who do the movement incorrectly would say it's overrated right? because they don't actually hollow out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's accurate. And then they're like, why is this so hard? It's right. like, well, because you're not doing the yeah. movement. Yeah, like, you're not squeezing properly. Is I, your, like, I like to think about my belly button going through my spine. Is your floor. lower back on the ground? Right. Or can I get my hand under there? Right. If my hand can go under there, you, either yeah. one, you don't have the core strength to do it, or you just or you do got it a wrong. brutal pelvic tilt. <laughs> yeah, the worst. All right, overrated, underrated, sticking with the ab movements here. Okay. More ab movements. Toes to bar. Strictly for abs, I think they're overrated. All right. And I, and I, my reason being is because there's more of a kip. I think you're obviously still using your trunk, but I think the glute ab exercise, the hollow body rocks, to me, they're the best like ways to really light up the, the, the abs. I think the, the toes, the bar, I think people tend to swing too much and they really struggle, especially on the eccentric. Then they have a knee flexion and they sort of cheat that, that eccentric portion. Honestly, I've always felt like if I put my toes in a little bit more and I, I really focus on not swinging, if I'm looking for just straight up abs, uh, I, I prefer that over toes to bar. I also like, again, we talked about this with even rope climbs or doing monkey bars with plate with a plate in my feet or like a, a tib curl bar yeah. in my feet. Doing monkey bars that way to me is much more of a, of a trunk challenge. Gotcha. Yeah. I always felt doing a strict toe to bar was much more an upper back movement. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. How you had to stabilize fair. to be able to like brace to even engage the core to do it. Yeah. Um, that was just my feeling. I'm not a gymnast, but like. Yeah. All right. This is your either or, Dane. Okay. Either or. This one um is, this is a good one. I like this one. Yep. Either this or this. Yeah, you have to pick one. Either here or there. <laughs> bad news bears or the sandlot i dude i grew up in the 90s i've got to go with sandlot all right good come on i was like, curious where you're there's going. no way there's <laughs> no way sandlot like don't come at me sandlot's unreal if you don't like it i won't you just you're pathetic you're a horrible soul <laughs> you're attacking people yeah, now. we yeah. just talked about don't attack people's character S sandlot has like such a dude that would be like we would watch sandlot on like if there was like a thunderstorm and we couldn't yeah. go outside or like um you know it, a snow day i i just it's such a good movie I, yeah, I like it. It's a great movie. Yeah. Bad News Bears. Does that get an R rating if it's released today? <laughs> Dude, probably. Yeah. It was probably. probably like PG back then. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Go to IMDb. Find out. Um, oh man, you talked about plyos. You talked about technical coordination. You want to say anything about reflexive movements and how they like tie into the abs at all before we get to the audience questions? I think that's just where you'll see like if you're doing a deceleration focus, like we did a Sanders cut in this jump series with Nick, where it's like plant. And you're gunning this, you're going this way, and then you got to cut and go forward. If your trunk's not under control, that's where you start to see the hiccup. That's where you start to see the trunk twist, and they'll start to 
they'll, they'll start to twist off center and then they're not going in the direction that they want to go. And I think that that's just where reflexive training comes into yeah. play. You teach them the skill. Now, all of a sudden, they're more rigid in their trunk and they can apply that and they can cut a little bit harder. And if people will look at it and say, oh, well, they, you know, they, they can cut. They're more agile, so they think it comes from the feet. And to a point, it does come from the feet, but it's also coming from the trunk. Real quick uh, periodization question, programming question that just came to my head. Um, if, with a field sport athlete, open skill sport, are you more likely to want to program isolation core movements or reflexive strength movements for them to like target core stuff? I would go a little bit more isolation and like exposure comprehension phase, and then as we get closer to a peak, go reflexive movements. Okay. Um, you ready for the audience questions? Yep. Join our Discord and subreddit too. Garage Strength. Yeah. Discord. It's Keist. Very fun. Yeah. Yeah. He goes to the lives too, or they go he, to the lives. Yeah, he, he definitely goes to the lives. Uh, what is the difference between working as private strength and conditioning coach compared to high school, college coach? Um, both in education required, but also the setup, the types of people you, you engage with, um, pressure to perform as a coach, and anything else that you think needs to be added to that. I think that the pressure to perform is probably drastically higher in a private setting because if like for you to be successful business wise, you've got to have word of mouth behind you. Um, so you have to have success. You have to treat people very well. You also have to manage a budget. And then when you're managing this budget, you also have to make decisions for marketing or for your, the business side that have nothing to do with being a strength coach. And so there's just a lot, I believe there's a lot more hurdles and challenges on the private end. It's a low barrier of entry. Um, education wise, I think you can have less education, formal education and strength and conditioning and get into private than you would in a school setting. But I, I do think it goes back to um, typically, in my opinion, just the, the private setting is just going to be harder in, in different in in different ways from traditional strength and conditioning. I think if you're in a, in a collegiate setting, you can operate in that setting very, you know, pretty easily. Um, and if the kids aren't listening to you or whatever, like, obviously it's not great, but it's, it's not going to be like, they're not going to fire you. Yeah. Someone else is paying your check kind of thing. Right. Right. So I think that that would be my answer. All right. All the, peripheral stuff like almost thematically yeah. tying into how we yeah. use the abs yeah with all yeah literally <laughs> all right this is a reddit delper delper one one this is a long one so i have to read three paragraphs before i think i get to the question question so let me read okay I got all right you. yesterday after a few sets of power version ollie lifts i decided to do some rep work on squat four by six no belt because core how about that duh i increased the weight only 10 pounds from the week prior challenging but not totally unreasonable right my right leg uh felt a little sore but nothing crazy and heck i'm already on my third set at the bottom of my third rep i left a pop tear in my right groin i dumped the weight forward and hit the floor it was a completely unique sensation i was a little worried to move to be safe i went to er to make sure it wasn't a new hernia needing surgery fast forward six hours yes it's a hernia and groin strain no it doesn't need surgery yet now i'm sidelined for however many weeks months i'm not sure it will be interesting to see how the prog how this pr progresses and how i can recover over the next few weeks i'm excited for the challenge but do i need to start playing by a completely different set of rules at this point always belt no deep anything etc dane are you going to start a garage strength yoga and knitting channel i can look forward to dude real quick i just want to say the yoga i do is hard yeah <laughs> well i think he's saying that though because he would do yeah, that instead to, of squatting to recover um that's actually almost exactly what happened with Jake. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I was going to say he's got a sports hernia. 100% I would say that. I mean, he, he did say he has a hernia. I I guess it's buys and tries. Jake's buys are getting really big. I think what I yeah, I think what <laughs> I would say for your recovery, like just focus on like calisthenics coming back, like single leg stuff, single leg squats, skater squats. That's going to target that that area a bit more. Um, I think that will increase your stability through that area, but also like the, the downfall with hernias is like, they're pretty freaking genetic. It's, it's like, there's, I, I could, I could list people here who lifted for 
25 years and they've never had a hernia at all. And then other people I know that come to the gym, they've had three hernias and they've had, you know, their dad had three hernias and their brother had three hernias. It's like, dude, it, there's like it, a lot of evidence that some, it, there's some genetic issues around it. Uh, so I, I don't know if I would say like you want to change everything. Maybe you want to change your goals as far as like how heavy are you going to be pushing? Uh, I don't know if you're still training for a sport or not. Um, I also would argue maybe four sets of six, maybe that was a little high with reps. I don't know. I, I, you know, depending upon how many powers you had done prior to that, but I think it's like just being aware and, and, and being very calculated with how you want to come back. I, and I, and, and visiting your mind and saying like, what do I want my long-term health, physical fitness, you know, sport goals to be? That's what I would do. Yeah. That's why I got to stop sprinting again. Yeah. You don't want to pull out a hamstring. <laughs> be out for freaking three months i'm hoping it's only like three days you go to tie your shoes you're like oh uh, my gosh that's the worst yeah yeah like you cough and you're like oh, oh god all the pain yeah. in the world why am i so weak <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> toughen up mentally that's it <laughs> that's funny if you want to be athletic open skill sports close skilled sports you better develop that dynamic trunk control absolutely and i think look at look at the look at that trunk as the foundation to uh, athletic capability and then look at it too through that lens of comparing it to that aerobic, yeah, that aerobic capacity. capacity yeah that was a i very much like that dane oh good, good. job you hey. did well hey thanks earl until next time peace Wait.